So what do you do if your country refuses to treat you as a citizen, but demands that you fulfill the responsibilities of one? This was a question that many young Japanese American men faced in January of 1944, when they learned that the draft was going to be instituted in the camps where they had been confined based on their race. Some of those young men decided that the correct response was to challenge this decision and to stand up to the United States in court to test what their citizenship rights actually were. Hello, my name is Kelly Stusi. I am the museum manager here at Heart Mountain Interpretive Center. And we are standing in the portion of our permanent exhibit dedicated to the Fair Play Committee. Heart Mountain's organized draft resistance movement. The Fair Play Committee actually predated the draft. Uh, it began as a place where young Japanese American men could meet and really exchange some of the grudges and discontents that they were feeling about the situation they had found themselves in. Part of what really got the Fair Play Committee going was a loyalty questionnaire that had been passed through the camps, and two questions in particular, the questions on the wall here. These questions were a problem for two, each for their own reasons. Question 27, are you willing to serve in the armed forces? Many of them were afraid that if they answered yes, that would be taken as volunteering for the army. Now, many of these young men had originally volunteered in the wake of Pearl Harbor, only to be rejected with the designation of enemy alien, despite the fact that they were American citizens. So many of them were very reluctant to volunteer once the army had opened up the possibility again. The second question, question 28, was a little more complicated for them. The second part of that question, to forswear all allegiance to the Japanese emperor. Many of them looked at that and said, if I say yes to this, does this mean that I am implicitly saying I was originally loyal to the Japanese emperor, even though I have never served the Japanese emperor in my life? These were the sorts of discussions that were swirling around the Fair Play Committee. And then, the draft was instituted in January of 1944. Once the draft was instituted in the camps, attendance at the Fair Play Committee exploded. All of the young men were facing the decision of whether or not, once they got their draft notices, they were going to respond. Would they go forth and serve in the American military? Or were they going to say, no, this isn't fair and this isn't right? Originally, the Fair Play Committee was very specific that they only wanted to clarify their citizenship rights, that this was the, these were the questions they were asking. They also limited their membership. To be a member of the Fair Play Committee, you had to be able-bodied, of age, an American citizen, and male. In other words, you had to be eligible for the draft. And members actually would sign a document that said that they were able-bodied and willing to serve if their citizenship rights were clarified. And this came to a head at the start of March 1944, when the Fair Play Committee came out and for the first time openly stated that they would not respond to a draft notice until they got their citizenship rights clarified. In other words, they officially declared that they were going to resist the draft. Now, the response within the Japanese American community to this was mixed. Most of the Japanese Americans agreed that this situation was not fair. However, Many of them felt that responding to the draft was either simply a necessary evil or the only way that they could really prove to the wider American community that they were loyal American citizens. 
The newspaper of the Heart Mountain, Heart, the Heart Mountain Sentinel, very much took this side of the argument. They distinctly did not approve of the Fair Play Committee and spoke out against it in nearly every edition. On the other hand, a Denver newspaper called the Rocky Shimpo, which was edited by James Omura, was very much on the side of the Fair Play Committee. James Omura argued that this was a necessary test of the constitutionality of what was happening to these people, being confined based on race without any actual accusation of wrongdoing, and then, while confined, being asked to serve in the draft, so involuntary service. And so, over the course of the month of March, within the Fair Play Committee, 63 young men received draft notices, and they did not get on the bus for their medical examinations. In other words, they refused to respond to the draft. And throughout the course of March, it really looked like there wasn't going to be a response to them. But at the end of March, federal marshals came and arrested those 63 young men. And this laid the stage for the largest mass trial in Wyoming history. The Heart Mountain 63 were tried in a mass trial in Cheyenne, Wyoming at the district court. They actually waived their right to a jury trial because they felt that their odds of getting a fair hearing from the average citizen plucked from the streets of Cheyenne were probably not very good. So they put their faith in the district judge, Mr. Judge Blake Kennedy, and trusted in his knowledge of the law. Unfortunately, Judge Kennedy was, shall we say, a man of his time, which is to say that the very first thing he said to these 63 young men was a racial slur. You can imagine that that did not bode well for their chances. And indeed, all 63 of these young men were convicted of having resisted the draft. The judge completely rejected their argument that they wanted to contest the constitutionality of even asking people who were already in confinement to respond to the draft. And so they were sentenced. Now, Heart Mountain wasn't the only place that had draft resistors. Throughout all of the camps, about 300 young men had refused to respond to the draft. In many of the cases where this happened, the judge simply remanded them back to the camps that they had been confined in in the first place. Or in one interesting case, a judge decided that he was going to forego any jail time and instead find each of the young men one penny. However, at Heart Mountain, they were sentenced to three years in prison. Why the judge made this particular choice is open. Many scholars think it was because Heart Mountain was the only place that had organized draft resistance. And so these young men were being made examples to the rest of the community. Even so, following this trial, another 22 young men refused to respond to the draft, leading to a total of 85 young men who resisted the draft at Heart Mountain, the highest number of any of these camps. In 1947, the Heart Mountain 63 and the other draft resistors were pardoned. Now, by this point, all of them had served their full sentences, so the pardon was, it didn't do much for them, but it did at least clear their names legally. The problem was that the divide I mentioned earlier within the Japanese American community continued. Many Japanese Americans and especially the Japanese American leadership, the Japanese American Citizens League, excoriated the resistors. They accused the resistors of being cowards or traitors. A lot of this had to do with the fear that by resisting the draft, these, these young men were encouraging the wider American community to see all Japanese Americans as disloyal. 
Even today, the concept of someone resisting the draft is often viewed as being a little bit suspect. Somebody is considered perhaps a little bit cowardly. That's a tradition that continued throughout the Vietnam War. It's only in very recent years that there has been an increasing recognition that sometimes by refusing to answer the draft, you're actually showing your loyalty to the country in a very different way, by showing your faith in the Constitution and testing the laws of our country to make certain that our leadership and our army and the country as a whole is holding to its own laws and oaths. Sadly, the divide in the Japanese American community continued for many years, and it was only at the start of the 21st century that any real reconciliation began. And even to this day, there is still something of a crack between the resistors of the draft and those who responded directly to the call to fight. Even so, the Heart Mountain Fair Play Committee remains an incredibly important part of Heart Mountain's history. This is a case where a relatively disenfranchised minority stood up very early in the history of our country and said, we need to test what's going on here. We want to challenge the laws that are making this possible. Thank you for coming and joining me today. And I would like to welcome you back next week for further online content. Thank you very much.